to the November President's Challenge, and this month's President's Challenge is Treen. Uh, so what the heck is a treen? And uh, it says here, treen, literally of a tree, is a generic name for small handmade functional household objects made of wood. Now I've been looking forward to this challenge for some time uh, because some months ago I was experimenting with how to make accurate measuring spoons. And so this President's Challenge gives me an excuse to finish up on that project. Now I got the idea for this project because I keep a lot of my ingredients in the kitchen in mason jars and instead of having to keep cleaning out the same measuring spoons over and over again, I thought, why couldn't I make some measuring spoons of the size that's most commonly used with that ingredient and just keep it in the jar all the time? Of course, I could just go out and buy several sets of measuring spoons and then divide them up into my mason jars, uh, but what would be the fun in that? Uh, besides, if I make my own, I can make them to spec. For instance, a lot of times, uh, with mason jars, there's not a lot of room for long handled spoons, so I can make my handles relatively short so they can fit inside of the mason jars. Now I've made, spoon, I've made scoops and spoons in the lathe before, uh, primarily using split turning, that is gluing two pieces together and then splitting them apart. But you end up with a hemisphere spoon, which is okay for some ingredients, but things like brown sugar tend to not want to come out of that spoon very well. So I want to have some kind of spoon that's a little bit more shallow, look a little bit more like a traditional a measuring spoon. And the way I figured out how to make a spoon that's shallow like that is to use a therming technique. Now anytime you have more than one piece, two pieces or more, mounted on the lathe at the same time and you're turning the same profile into all the pieces, uh, that could be called therming. And uh, I've used therming before on other President's Challenges. Back in February I used uh, a therming jig to hold four candlesticks all at once to make the Rude Alsenick type uh, candlesticks. And then in March, uh, the inside-out turning, inside-out turning is essentially a form of therming as well. Uh, it's just that all of the pieces are strapped together at once, but you're still doing multiple pieces at the same time. This time I'm going to do a slightly different kind of therming that I've done before, uh, where I'm going to use a sacrificial piece in the center, uh, sandwiched between the two actual work pieces. And I've used this uh, technique before to make a narrow, to make a football-shaped vessel. Uh, so in that case, I was making two halves of a piece and I put them together, just similar to, you, similar to what you would do with an inside-out turning. Uh, but this time, I'm going to leave the pieces separately. So I'm actually going to be able to make two spoons at once. All right, the first thing I need to do is to assemble my blank. And I'm going to make my spoons out of hard maple. So I have two pieces of uh, four-quarter hard maple. And I'm going to sandwich a sacrificial piece of half-inch MDF in between. Um, now. As far as what width these need to be, uh, they need to be wider than this whole stack. So this is actually 13 16 these two pieces and a half inch. So I have just about two and an eighth inches. That means all my pieces need to be at least two and an eighth inches. Probably better to be a little bit uh, over just in case I can't quite get these assembled. Uh, perfectly. That way I have a little bit of play. Now if you're buying your stock from a home center, you might likely have it already planed down to three quarters of an inch and you might be cutting a little bit close. Um, I buy this the same place the cabinet makers make and it's not final plane down so it's actually uh, just under 13 16 and that little bit extra is going to give me what I need because I need to turn this into a two inch cylinder. Now to assemble these together, I'm not going to use glue, I'm actually going to use Turner's tape. But I don't want to use Turner's tape directly against the maple because sometimes Turner's tape can be so strong when you pull it apart uh, it tears out. So what I'm going to do is against the maple I'm going to use a layer of blue tape. And be careful not to overlap the pin the be careful not to overlap the blue tape. Uh, if there's a little bit of a gap in between that's going to be fine. And then I'll put my Turner's tape on top of the blue tape. I'm not too worried about the little bit of gap here. Now I'm not going to use blue tape on the MDF in between because that's completely sacrificial. I don't care if that gets all torn up. Since Turner's tape is somewhat pressure sensitive, I'm going to just give this clamp this just for about five minutes or so. Alright, a shot of espresso later, and I'm going to pop these out. 
And the next step, it'd be, the next step is I want to flush up the three pieces on either end. I'm going to do it on the miter saw, but if you don't have a miter saw, you can use a tail saw or use a band saw or whatever kind of saw you have available to you. All right, time to mark my ends, and I want to make sure I'm really spot on, especially in this direction. I want to be dead center in the middle of the sacrificial piece in the middle. And now I can finally mount my little sandwich onto the lathe. Uh, now because this MDF is kind of soft, um, I want to make sure I use on the tailstock, I'm going to use a cup center. If I use a regular pointed center, uh, that could split the MDF pretty easily. Uh, and the same thing on the, uh, on the drive center side, this is actually, actually a depressible uh, center here. It has a little bit of stiffness, but it won't dig in so far that it splits the MDF in half. And just perhaps just to show that I do own one and use one from time to time, uh, I'm actually going to go ahead and use a roughing gouge. Now if you're really close to two inches, if you don't have, uh, if you started with actual three quarter inch thick stock as opposed to a little bit oversized like I did with 13 16 you want to make sure you don't overdo it on the roughing. I got to make sure I don't take any more off any more than I need to because I need to make a two inch sphere uh, for the cups. And to make sure I'm far enough away from the end, since I know I'm going to be using a two inch sphere, I'm just going to mark this about an inch and a half so I know where the center of my circle is. That'll be my two inch center circle for the bowl section. The bowl is going to, the two bowl parts of the, the bowl sections of the spoon are going to be right here. So now what I'm aiming for is a tablespoon. And so what I need is for a tablespoon is I need this outside to be uh, two inches in diameter, but more specifically, I need the width of the bowl, just the maple part, to be about one and seven eighths. So I'm going to start by sizing this to two inches, to sizing the center of my bowl section of the spoon. To two inches. And I can check just the bowl section. So I want just the maple. And I'm not quite there yet. So I'll take off just a hair more. And not quite there, about another 16th inch to go. And that looks pretty close. Again, what I'm looking for is I'm trying to measure from the maple, edge of the maple, to the edge of the maple. And right now it's right on seven eighths of an inch. Now to do the bowl section of the spoon, uh, I've brought back a familiar jig. In fact, the, the jig I used just last month to do the, uh, the bar pulls and the half pregnant silhouette. Um, and actually I'm using it for this jig to set up for its original purpose this time, which is to make a perfect sphere. So the first thing I need to do, I've got the platform set up and the light centered fairly well. Uh, and so to make a sphere this time, I'm going to use a piece of paper and I'm just going to mark right where I've already sized it, right here and right there. 
And so now I just need to turn this into a circle. So I'm going to estimate the center, just eyeball, estimate the center initially. Using the two marks as a reference. And then I'm going to put the center right in the middle of that. Need to bring it out just a little bit and draw my circle right there. And now I'll just need to line this back up and taper down. And just like last time, I'm just going to cut this to match the shadow underneath. Who'd have known this technique would come back so soon? here where the bowl meets the handle I find it can be kind of tricky because it's kind of deceiving with this half inch spacer uh, sacrificial piece in between um, because it looks pretty thick uh, and so you you tend to want to keep cutting and I found the first time I did this uh, I went way too thin and that's just not acceptable that's just gonna break um, so I have to be really careful so I'm gonna go ahead and size this out now and uh, since this is half inch and I want at least a quarter inch here that means uh, I want a one inch diameter, I want to size this to one inch diameter, probably a little bit more until I get closer to uh, finishing that part of the work. So I'm going to set my calipers to uh, maybe about an inch and a quarter and I can go ahead and size this up quickly with a parting tool. You can see it looks like it'd be really fat at this point, uh, but in fact, that's going to be a little over a quarter inch thick at the handle. See right there, it's just about three eighths of an inch thick. That just the handle part itself. So I've removed the shadow jig uh, since I finished making the sphere part of the bowl of the of the spoon, um, and then I noticed that my MDF was starting to split at this end, and so I probably shouldn't have quite finished. I should have left a little bit of maple there until the very end, um, but I've soaked it with some MDF and I've wrapped it up with some tape, and hopefully it holds. I'm just going to have to be a little bit gentle uh, removing this material over here, which I have quite a bit to do, so I'm going to have to take my time. 
uh, getting rid of that. And I want to get this down to about the same as here, so about an inch and a quarter. So normally I'd probably just lay into this uh, with some peeling cuts of the skew. Uh, but since then now I have to be a little bit gentle because of that MDF getting away, I'm just going to use a series of uh, planing cuts, uh, keeping that tip into the work. That way, when you have the tip into the work a little bit with the shoe, it tends to not put as much pressure, lateral pressure on the wood. All right, I was finally able to hobble through it. Uh, it would have gone a lot faster if I hadn't uh, left this so weak. I could have just left some maple on there and then come back and finish it off at the very end. That would have left the whole thing much stronger. But I managed to get through it, uh, being very careful with, uh, with using planing cuts instead of peeling cuts. Now, one of the nice things I like about this technique, a lot of times you have to be careful when you're parting off and you always have that little nub left. Since the middle is all sacrificial, all I got to do is pull it off the lathe now uh, and just separate it from the MDS. After, of course, a little bit of sanding. Now one thing to notice, it's actually quite deceiving. It looks like the handles are going to be pretty fat. But if you look at just the maple part, it actually is not that fat. Um, that's one thing that can kind of throw you off when you use this technique when you have this uh, sacrificial piece in the middle. So what I need to do now is split this apart. But I find it easier, instead of trying to separate it right now from the MDF, um, which can be kind of risky. I might break any kind of weak points, like say where the handle meets the, the bowl. Uh, so usually what I end up doing is just breaking the MDF itself first. That one downside of the MDF, of course, was it didn't hold up once I cut through the maple. Uh, but the advantage is it's weak enough that it's easy to separate from the rest, from the work without damaging the work. And there's one, there's one scoop. You can see how much, uh, if you've ever had, if you ever used uh, double t uh, Turner's tape and had it uh, rip out before, uh, you can see why I use the blue tape now. It's nice and smooth. It's, there was no fiber stripped out at all. So now I have to mount the spoon back in as face work and hollow out this section, but it can't really exactly put it in a regular chuck because I have this handle out here. So what I figured out I can do is I can make a special collet jig that's going to fit inside uh, of the chuck that can hold this. Uh, so um, it's a little bit hard to explain, so I'm just going to have to do it and you'll see uh, how it works. Um, hopefully you'll get to a point where you say, aha, now I get it. Because um, I could explain it here for about half an hour. I think. But instead, I think I'll just show. So this side of the jig is actually this is the jig is actually in backwards right now. This side is actually going to be flipped around and put into the chuck. So I want to start forming a tenon uh, right uh, on this side. So normally though, you want a chuck to be almost closed uh, when you make a tenon, but in this case, I don't have the right size chuck uh, to fit the tablespoon. So I'm gonna just use the chuck, I'm gonna use the jaws fairly wide open.
and I'll check to see if that's enough. Now I'm going to have to go a little bit more. I only have to make this once. I think I only have to make once for each side measuring spoon that I make. And once I have this working for this size, and that fits inside nicely. So I'm gonna, since I'm going to be using this again and again, uh, I'm going to mark uh, my number one jaw. And now I need to hollow out this space to fit the outside diameter of the bowl section of the tablespoon. And actually, I might want to go just a little tight. Now you could use a drill to get rid of most of this, uh, but I'm not going to bother. I'm just going to hollow it out with my half inch spindle gouge. Now a lot of times when people, when turners make um, hemispherical, in other words a full half circle bowl, uh, they use just kind of a press fit. Um, but what I found is because I'm using uh, only a uh, sphere cap as my bowl section, if I try to just press fit something in here, it's going to pop out. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to undercut this just a little bit, give myself a little bit of a lip around the edge, uh, and that will hold my... Uh, That'll, that will hold the bowl section uh, against the rim nicely. I think I'll be able to do this just by using a parting tool like a scraper flatten the tool rest. So I don't want to have I want I don't want to be too narrow on my rim, so I'm gonna go about an eighth of an inch in. And I'm just gonna make a little notch right there. And that'll hold my rim. Now you may be wondering, how am I going to get this in there and hold it in tight? Uh, well, that is the next step. So right now, obviously, there's no way to mount this uh, tablespoon into the collet jig. Uh, what I need to do now is I need to cut a, a notch in here. Uh, so what I did is, I, that's my number one. That was my reference. Um, jaw. So now I'm, I'm going to cut away where the number two jaw is. And hopefully, oh, I need to make a little bit more. The handle doesn't quite fit through, so I'm going to have to make that a little bit bigger. And that's better. Fairly tight fit. So now I have the uh, tablespoon mounted in the um, uh, mounted into the uh, collet jig, but I still have a little bit of a problem. I can't quite fit this in. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to remove one of my jaws, my number two jaws, right where I cut that slot. Now normally you wouldn't want to operate with only three jaws, uh, you know, say uh, turning a bowl or something, uh, but this is small enough, it's not going to be a problem. Pop that right in there. Line up my number one jaw again. And tighten that down. Not doesn't have to be that tight, just tight enough to snug it. It'll, it's not going anywhere. And the other thing that's nice about this setup is that I can, add, I can feel, as I start to hollow out, I can kind of get a sense of how thick it is because I can get my finger down there and feel the thickness of it. And now it's just a matter of hollowing it out like a little bowl. So I'll go with a really small gouge. I'll just use a quarter inch gouge. 
Make sure it's not hitting anything. It'd be a shame to break off that handle at this point. That's actually feeling pretty good. Now, the math that I did in order to figure out that I needed a one and seven eighths wide uh, bowl, it was based on having about a sixteenth of an inch rim. Um, but that math will only get you so close. Uh, so how do you get it more accurate? How do I? Well, how do I know when to stop hauling? I want exactly one tablespoon. Well, what I figured out I did is I took some Play-Doh, kids' Play-Doh, and I used uh, one of my existing tablespoons and essentially measured out one tablespoon of Play-Doh. And I've got it wrapped in saran wrap just to make sure it doesn't get all over the wood. And then I made a little tamper. This is nice and flat. And so I just need to Give it a try. I'm going to stuff this Play-Doh, one tablespoon of Play-Doh, right in the bowl section. And this tamper is made to go just inside of my jig. And if I squish this down and it's still coming over the rim, that means I still need to go a little bit more. And at this point, since I only want to take off a small amount, I'm going to put down the, the uh, I'm going to put down the uh, gouge, and I'm going to go with a small negative rake scraper. And from here, it's just a matter. Uh, so at the same time, I don't. This is now because this is a utility piece. I'm not worried about it being super smooth, super perfect uh, sphere on the inside. But since I'm already taking away a little bit more to try to get it the right volume, uh, I might as well do a, what I can. So let's try it again. Let's see. Let's push this back. Put the edges back in. And there's still a little bit leaking out on the side. And I'm thinking that's close enough for my kitchen. Uh, especially after a little sanding, it might be spot on at that point. Yeah. All right, there it is, another tablespoon for my kitchen. Uh, so I went ahead and finished this with walnut oil. You could have used tongue oil uh, just as well. Any kind of drying oil will do the trick. And I didn't fuss too much with the sanding because this is gonna be put to use in my kitchen. Now, if you're interested in how to figure out the volume of part of a sphere like this, uh, what you want to search for is the volume of a sphere cap. Um, so you might be able to figure out how to make uh, different size uh, spoons, perhaps a teaspoon. Or if you live on the other side of the pond, you can figure out uh, the metric versions of uh, measuring spoons. So that's my precedence challenge this time. I'm going to go put this to use in my kitchen right now. And until next time, happy Thanksgiving and uh, thanks for watching.